considered this gesture to be a symbol for silence or secrecy. And from this has arisen the custom of placing the finger to the lips as a motion for quietness and secrecy, and we do it today. Statues of the god Harpocrates were placed at the entrances to temples and sacred retreats where the dramas of the mysteries were performed as a sign that silence and secrecy should be observed in the holy places and that all initiates were bound by vows of discretion. Harpocrates is also sometimes shown standing, and at other times he is depicted seated on the blossom of a lotus, <laughs> just like Buddha. Although he is usually figured with childish immaturity of body, the imperfection of his lower limbs, as described by Plutarch, is not apparent in any of the Egyptian drawings. It therefore seems that the statements concerning this deformity should be more carefully examined. Samuel Squire, whose translation of Plutarch's Isis and Osiris, made in 1744, is still the most often quoted by Egyptologists. Well, he states definitely, quote, lame in his lower limbs. G.R.S. Mead translated the same essay much later and gives a slightly different rendering of Plutarch's words. Mr. Mead says, quote, weak in his limbs from below upwards, unquote. This difference in wording, though slight, may have an unexpected significance. You see, there's some general information contained in Senecius's Treaty on Providence that should be included in this Osirian epic. Senecius is of the opinion that Osiris should be regarded as an historical king whose father, transcending in wisdom, instructed his benevolent son in all the secrets of the divine science of government. Phoenicius is moved to this conclusion by a desire to keep all speculation within the sphere of the reasonable. The Platonist bishop seems to have derived much of his account from origins foreign to Plutarch's treatise, or possibly he interpreted differently the restrictions imposed by his vow. Phoenicius a prudent and conscientious author, wary of myths and fables, and exhibiting a truly platonic conservativeness in his handling of subject matter, yet Phoenicius was beyond question a deeply religious philosopher and an initiate of pagan mysteries prior to his conversion to the Christian faith, and therefore may have hidden the true meaning of the fable. Thomas Taylor is of the mind that the treatise on providence was written while Senecius was still a votary of pagan mysteries. Now, if so, the writing is unbiased and trustworthy and presents a fair picture of the mystery, mystical uh, traditions of the Egyptians interpreted in terms of Platonic metaphysics, but only the exoteric could be allowed to be seen by the profane. Senecius inserts into his narrative a considerable description of the various character of Osiris, which he sharply contrasts with the vice-ridden nature of Typhon. He also explains in detail the process of election by which Osiris came to the throne of Egypt. The electional ceremony as described by Senecius is evidently itself a fragment from some secret ritual relating to the installation of a hierophant of the mysteries. Next, Osiris receives from his father an elaborate dissertation in the platonic temper concerning the relative power of good and evil in which he is fully warned against the machinations of Typhon. Possibly the most important sentence in Senecius' treatise occurs during this dissertation. The father of Osiris is made to say to his son, quote, you also have been initiated in those mysteries in which there are two pair of eyes, and it is requisite that the pair which are beneath should be closed when the pair that are above them perceive, and when the pair above are closed, those which are beneath should be opened." Unquote. Now these words unquestionably have an arcane meaning and are incorporated into the narrative that the true significance of the whole Osirian cycle might not be entirely obscured. And I can tell you that the meaning, folks, is that the eyes above are the exoteric mint for the outer world, for the profane. 
and the eyes below are the esoteric meant for the initiate, the adept, the priest of the mystery schools only. Thanesius does not describe the death of Osiris, but merely reports his vanishment and final restoration to the throne. In the latter part of the story, there was also introduced a certain philosopher who was a stranger in Egypt. This philosopher predicts the fall of Typhon and is an eyewitness to the recrowning of Osiris. Senecius says of this philosopher, quote, He likewise then learned some particulars about Osiris which would shortly happen and others which would take place at some greater distance of time. These, these, when the boy Horus would choose as his associate in battle a wolf instead of a lion. But who the wolf is is a sacred narration, which it is not holy to divulge even in the form of a fable." Unquote. Well, the lion, we know, has always been of the tribe of Judah. Such is the amazing tradition of the good king Osiris, the first victim, the first mummy, and the first resurrection. He dies and is born again in three forms. First, as god of the underworld, where he rules the justified dead. Second, as the younger Horus, in whose form he battles for his own honor. And third, as Harpocrates, the silent child. The latter two forms are regarded as incarnations or embodiments of his very self. Yet he exists independent of them as the judge of shades and the lord of the resurrection. Now we know that Osiris was also known as the sun, and Horus was known as the child are the young Osiris, the young Horus, the baby Horus. So after the sun set in the west, when it rose the next morning, it rose as the young Horus, and as it went across the sky, it became Osiris and then the elder. But in the legends, it's differently at different times, Osiris or Horus. Horus the younger, Horus at his peak strength at noon, and Horus the elder. It is also Osiris. So you see that these figures intermingle in the legend, but it all has meaning, and it will all be clear to you at a later time. Now, just because you don't understand some of this, and you may be a little lost, don't worry, it will come together. Don't, don't miss one single word of this series of episodes of the hour of the time. If you do, I can guarantee you will regret it for the rest of your life. We're going to stop right now, folks. We have to take a break. I will be back right after this very short pause. <laughs> 